It was an honor to be able to go to each of their homes to understand what makes them click, what makes their, them get up, as, as Joe has said about Benny, and answer the phones for every day for the last 30 years. That doesn't mean that I think I can do it. It means that I am in awe and, and in so many ways indebted to them. Our nation is indebted to the farm advocates who stood up. No one taught them, they taught themselves, and now they're here to teach the rest of us. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so without further ado, I wanna hear from these wonderful people, friends of mine now, and uh, the, uh, the folks who helped organize this put this in alphabetical order. There's no order of importance, so I think that's, that's a good way to start. It will. Let me ask you a question. So, M Mona Lee Brock from Durant, Oklahoma, you fielded so many calls from suicidal farmers. How did you keep them on the phone line? How did you keep them going? What kept you going? Maybe you have a story for us about one of those calls. Well, I, I do. Is this? Yes, just okay. a little. Uh, I do. Uh, the first, you know, I went into where I worked there for so many years, and my role, my job description was only to be a referral source for the farmers and, and put them in contact with the help that they need according to their uh, situation. And I got a call one day from a farmer, and my goodness gracious, uh, I asked what in the world uh, did I hear on the, in the other side of the telephone. And he said, well, this sound that you are hearing, is that it? Yep, yeah, it is. And uh, he told me that it was an auction taking place out behind him, and he decided that he would call in. And sitting there, I, I, I thought, oh my goodness, what in the world? And I need to go back to where I came from right fast because I didn't know what to do in a case like that. And then the next sound I heard was the clicking of a cylinder, is that what you call it, on the gun. And I said, now what is that sound? And he told me. And uh, that's when I started praying again. And I did pray and I prayed hard. I, uh, at that moment, and he was far away from me across the state and I was uh, seated at my desk wondering what, uh, how in the world I could contact some person to go to him. And at that moment, it was impossible, and uh, I started talking to him. The best thing that I knew to do at that moment was to keep him engaged in conversation, talking to, uh, to me about his family, about his farming, everything. And uh, I told him uh, that we discussed uh, uh, the farm that was being auctioned off, that he was young, that he could start over. And from that point on, the next one uh, that came in was a neighbor who was telling me that he was doing fine, just about as possibly as uh, the best he could do in his lifetime, had no complaints about anything, and then uh, the call came to me the next morning that he had gone over to his north pasture to check on his cattle and he had called his daughter to come over and pick up his body. And at that moment, I knew that something was terribly, terribly, terribly wrong. And I started uh, working and uh, working with the attitude of picking up clues in their conversation because they were coming in coming in fast and they were already in depression and my only hope was uh, to get a network across the state uh, that I could write a note to the secretary to call that contact person in the county in which the farmer lived and I would keep the farmer on the telephone 
uh, talking to me until a knock came to his door. This was the best and the most effective way that I knew of and that it did work. And we were able to put local farmers, the, neighbor, the neighbors of those farmers in contact with him until we could get some help to him and possibly uh, organize some means for him to receive treatment or to go to uh, a local mental health institution for in-house treatment for quite a long time and just engaging the farmer in conversation and that there was hope for tomorrow that this is not going to get him down he's made it this long and uh, the underlying thing was to keep him going keep him on the telephone until those people could get there and then we would uh, contact a mental health professional to go to him and get the professional help to help him over the depression. Thank you. And I wanted to thank Dr. Wallace, who's here, who also responded as a psychologist, and he's here. We've worked with him, and also Ronnie, who, uh, who told about being a teenager witnessing his mother. That leaves a long-lasting impression. Let's pass the mic down to to Benny, please. And um, so I, I first met Benny Bunting back in the 80s when uh, we were organizing the United Farmers Organization. Benny became a leader of that, now works for, for RAFI in uh, North Carolina. Um, how does your own experience as a farmer, as a contract poultry grower, or how did that play into your advocacy, Benny? And um, what, what do you take from that with your work with farmers today? Okay, uh, the contracts are written, you know, they're leverage contracts anyhow, they're written by the companies. We get, but they have great uh, promotional literature that comes with them, so you're enticed to get in. Everything looks really good. It's similar to, and I just, it was looking at contracts, you know. I did not have much, the contract I had uh, did not last long. They wanted to change contracts if, within six months. You know, they had to come up with a new contract and they signed. And I said, well, what is a contract? You know, but I have a seven-year contract. If it's, and I just would not sign contracts that had no value. And it, it just got to me in the experience that I had in trying to advocate for myself and uh, my family that other farmers were facing, you know, the same stresses that we were with being you know, we were in debt bondage. We had no assets other than what was pledged, you know, to the lending institution, and it was based on a poultry contract. And so <clears throat> we tried to get farmers together. There was a good friend of mine, David Mayer and myself, and we started working together trying to organize poultry growers. We rode the countryside, just trying to talk to poultry growers, see if they were having some of the same misgivings on contract farming that we were having. And it, it was very similar. But everybody was in the same shape that we were. You know, their homes were leveraged. If they didn't have poultry in those facilities, they were gonna be out on the street because they couldn't pay the note that was held against their, their home, their farm. Uh, so in working with farmers, in the United Farmers Organization, which Rafi helped get going. We started working on what was in the credit situation with everybody. We had, myself and several others, got really interested in the credit committee's work, which was that you, you had to have knowledge you, it could not be who you knew. It could not be that you, it could not continually be that you called a congressman and he was gonna help you. 
And that's not the way it should have worked anyhow. It should, it should not work on uh, benefit by who you know. It should be what you know and what you're doing. And so we work on educating ourselves and others in that group and in those committees so that we knew how to advocate for ourselves and advocate for others. And it just started to mushroom as far as working for a benefit for, for others. But it's, it's, you know, it started with knowing what a contract was and what a poultry contract was. And I probably have read many a contract and I know what they say and I know how they're, uh, they're devious in some of the things they say. You know, people always say, that thing where they got us in that we had a guarantee, you know, for 10 years. And then you read over two pages, but we didn't read it soon enough. It says that flocks will be placed from time to time as market needs demand and chicks become available. One flock is all we had a guarantee for. And that's what, you know, got me started on being able to read the reg And the regulations are just the same way almost. When you read something that the agency puts out, when they are denying our, our loans, our applications, anything that we're, we're putting in, they're not based always on the instructions that come from the regulations. They're misinterpretations of those regulations and how to, to go through, read, study, and just be vigilant of, you know, of, of what's said and, and work. It started working for myself and then it evolved working for others through poultry. Let me just hand this to Linda. Um, Linda from Dodge City, Kansas, after surviving the 1980s rural crisis yourself, you became a certified mediator for the Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. What skill sets became important for advocates to have in the 80s, and how does it differ today? Um, I know that when we were on the phone thinking about putting together this panel, uh, Ms. Mona Lee Brock had said that all of you shared notes. All of you worked together as a team, as a family, as was, as was said earlier. Um, tell us something about the 1980s and your own struggles and how that applies to today. Um, well, first of all, I'm still thinking, um, I thought I looked a lot younger than I did up there, <laughs> I'm right. just kidding. <laughs> That's what it is, yeah. In the 1980s, the first, I mean, I was one of them that was fortunate to drive a tractor in D.C. with American Ag. And we kept saying, if there isn't a change in 10 years, you will see grass grow in the streets. And we did. And I will always remember the day we received our foreclosure papers. We were three days past payment. And I was so smart at that point. I paid the postage to receive our foreclosure papers. Um, and I made a pact there would be no lender that ever that would make me cry again. And there wasn't. Um, we had to reach out somewhere and I had to get an off-farm job. I was very fortunate to uh, become and develop the real life office for the Diocese of Dodge City and it just came from there. We did. We all shared notes. We, if you heard of somebody that was able to do something you didn't ask their background, you didn't ask anything, you just needed to know what they did, how they did it, did it work? If it didn't work, you put it in the pile that don't do this, because it's not gonna work. Um, just, I had forgotten this, just very quickly, but I was at the first flag training where uh, Len and Susan were, and I went home. They had told us that if both names are not on the loan papers. The spouse only owes half the loan. 
We had a lot of coffee clubs around that issue. And I was about as popular as a skunk at a garden party. But it was those kinds of things. And then um, the question that I was asked is, the similarities between advocacy and a mediator. I went kicking and screaming with my heels in the dirt deep when they asked me to come to mediation training. I mean, I was, a group of us kept saying there's got to be a better way. We lost lots and lots of banks in, in Kansas as other places did. But outside entities were making decisions for us in our communities and it, it just wasn't working. And as mediation was developed, it had to be for the rural culture, not the urban culture, the rural culture. And so it was, it, and it is, it is a very distinct cultural type. Um, I had to think on it pretty hard simply because you learn to go from one to the other. And you just do it because you've got to listen so intently. Um, and so I think as an advocate, we walk along and in front of, and we can be a voice for uh, the family. In mediation, we help stir everything so they all have a voice for a solution that they can all own. And that puts them on a much better footing for success. It is key in mediation where confidentiality, and boy, I'm a stickler on that. Confidentiality is within that space of that process. If it is not honored, we could have a house of cards fall continuously. It's a very big concern that they want to scale back on the federal level. They want to scale mediation back. That's not going to be good at all. We're using mediation now to help families stay together through the uh, generational passing down of farms. And so you all and us, we've got to make sure that mediation stays in the farm bill and utilize it and make it grow. Thank you. By the way, are these not some of the most beautiful people you've ever seen? I mean, okay. And also, I, I didn't want anybody to leave with the impression that People were only working in their households. These people have become national, in, including with elected office and appointed office and so forth. And the next few people are going to talk some about that, uh, including uh, Lou Ann Kling. We saw her at the, uh, the uh, state office. She's also worked in Washington. You helped develop the Minnesota Farm Advocate Program, Lou Ann Kling, in, from Granite Falls. What was that program? And what did you accomplish with, as farm advocates? Well, it all, it all started um, in 1980. Uh, we had just started farming, and we just couldn't believe how bad it was. Even though we had Wayne's parents helping us, it still was tough. And we had a bunch of kids to feed, and it, uh, we said, somebody's got to do something. And we'd go to farmers' union meetings, we'd go to NFO meetings, you know, somebody's got to do something. And everybody would drop their head and mumble and mumble. Nobody wanted to do nothing. And so I looked at Wayne and said, well, I guess we got to do something. So we decided to plow under our land. We had a nice field of oats. And we said on the 4th of July, 1980, we're gonna plow that under one acre per day in protest to the low farm prices because we could get more out of it plowing it under as green manure 
than we could get spending the money to harvest. We got some neighbor ladies together and we started writing. Everybody brought any magazine they got and we sent a notice to them, we're plowing under our land, da da da. And, and so we had lots of letters going and so we said, uh, somebody said, well, maybe we should put a signature on this and a phone number if somebody wants more questions. And, uh, oh, not me, not me. I said, oh, well, you can put my name down, I don't care. And, and my mother-in-law started writing my name and she was starting to write Mrs. Wayne Kling. I said, hey, 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 that's not my name. I said, my name's Loya. And whew, she got huffy. I mean, she just <laughs> Bob, broke that pencil writing that. But about five years later, someone said, hey, are you Hank's wife? And she said, I have a name. So you can teach, <laughs> even in little areas. Anyway, we plowed under, we had uh, maybe 30 farmers. A um, lot of the neighbors called that early that morning and said, I can't plow under, that's my profit. I thought, well, you haven't got a profit, but if you don't know it yet, why find out. So we plowed under, and Ann and Chuck Canton, I'm sure lots of you knew those people, um, they came down and they had a picture they had plowed under. And, and so, first time I met her, and we just started talking, and we had so much in common, and, and she agreed we had to do something. And so, um, we, as we worked over the winter, wow, it just nothing got better and legislation was terrible and we'd talk about how do you make change? You gotta, you either gotta run for office or something because you can, you're not gonna make change just one at a time out here. And said, you know, we gotta, you know, we gotta go upstream and go downstream and find out who's throwing these farmers in. We gotta figure out who the problem is. So uh, I said, well, I'll run for office. I called up Wayne in the middle of the afternoon and said, hey, I'm gonna run for a state office seat. Do you care? He said, no, I guess I can take care of the kids. And uh, so I threw my hat in and I talked only about agriculture. That was my issue. There was about five other guys running from other districts and they'd come to me and say, Luann, we can't do nothing about agriculture in Minnesota. That's a federal issue. I said, no, it's not. You know, we can do something here. So we started in on minimum price bill for stopping foreclosures, moratoriums. I lost the election, which was probably good. Um, <laughs> But about a week after the election, a neighbor farmer came over and he said, you know, I told people to vote for you and he said, I voted for you and now you said you'd help farmers and you gotta help me. The Farmers Home Administration is gonna send me to prison. I said, for what? Well, they claim I spent money and it was theirs. Well. I called around to people, I, I think you've seen that on the film, I found out some information and I went and read his file. And in that file, it gave me every answer I wanted. He had called them, he brought the check in, the loan officer endorsed it, told him to go home and buy his supplies. And so we appealed, went to the appeal, the, the, Farmer's Home didn't want me in the appeal. We told him we'd sue him. The lawyer said, well, look out the window. We got WCCOI team out here sitting with a bunch of farmers. Oh, we, we did the appeal and I asked a lot of questions, but the last question I said was, isn't that true, Mr. Loan Officer, that you are responsible for paying that $26,000 back because you're the one that spent it? And 
the, the appeal was over and he said, come up Monday morning, we'll fix everything. I said, I hit on something. And so that's how it all kicked off. And then he told somebody and it went on and on and on. And about that time, Governor Perpich was, or he was running for governor, about five, six of us got him for a day and educated him on agriculture and what needed to be done. He uh, supported all of those issues. And so after he got elected, he called Ann Canton and said, Ann, you want to be commissioner of ag in Minnesota? And Ann said, oh my gosh, I don't know. Well, he put Jim Nichols in as commissioner and Ann is assistant commissioner. So then I went to Ann and said, gee, Ann, look at all these people. They're going broke and I can't help them all and we need help and we need money to drive our cars. And so Ann said, well, I'll see if I can get some money out of Jim. So she asked him and Jim said, why that radical? We can't let her give her money to go out and terrorize the countryside. And uh, so Ann kept talking to him and then Mark Ritchie came around and there was different people that were putting in good words. So we finally got some money and we called in, put out a notice, called in people. Janice, one of the ones that answered the ad, came into St. Paul and for three days we gave, and Lynn and Jim, were, you, you were there, three days of hardcore training on what to do to help farmers put out a press release with their names and telephone numbers. There was, I think, about 40 people in that training and sent them home. And they had phone calls waiting for them when they got home. And that's, that's how that program came together. 29 or 30 years later, the state is still funding that program and it's still running. Thank you. And we have a couple of representatives from Farmers Legal Action Group here. Lynn Hayes and Stephen Carpenter, I know. Is Randy here too? Yeah. Randy's going to be here later. Thanks for all the work. So one of my favorite uh, moments in the film, I have about a thousand favorite moments, but the was seeing you, uh, Betty Puckett, in Louisiana holding the book with Farmers uh, Foreclosure Defense back in the day, and then we have it also presently, and you pull out this green notebook and you hold it. What is involved in farm legal defense as a lay person farmer? Tell us some stories about that. Okay, I'll tell you one story that Close. I wrapped up this year. Uh, a farmer called, well, he wasn't a farmer, he was the son of a farmer who died in 2006. And he was wanting to save the family home and as a legacy keep his cow and cattle operation going, or his, you know, his father's legacy, he said. So um, at the time he called me, he had been denied uh, loan servicing. Uh, his account, or the account, had not been serviced since 1997. So it was pretty, pretty delinquent, because this was 2008. And he had already filed his application for loan servicing, and he was denied because he didn't have one form in there that was correct. And um, we appealed it, we went to mediation, appealed it. It was still denied. Um, went through several other appeals with this case. Um, and in the meantime, this young man became a self-advocate himself. He got where he could write his own letters. He would counsel with me. Uh, he was in Mississippi. He would counsel with me, and I would tell him what to write, and, um, and he would do it. He was very well capable of doing it. Some of the farmers I've worked with were not capable of doing it, so I always did it, but he was capable. Um, and the thing we made sure of right up front was because this was a cow and calf operation that he got release of income proceeds 
if FSA wanted to fight us for a long battle, they weren't going to starve him off the farm. He was going to have funds released from the sale of those calves until we got the case finally settled. So about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, he went through all the loan servicing process and came to the debt settlement process. And he filed an application for debt settlement. The debt settlement was finally approved this year and they have their debt with FSA all gone. And, and I asked him just a few days ago how his, how his mother was doing. And he said, with this debt lifted off of her home, she is so much better now. So, um, so he's, he, he's advocating for his brother, his uncle right now, who just got a notice of um, treasury offset on his tax refunds. Many of you know Shirley Sherrod as a, a national civil rights activist, leader, and uh, office holder, and her story goes far and wide. Um, I was also honored to uh, be able to interview Reverend Charles Sherrod, who's here in the audience, and other people who work at the Southwest Georgia Project. And I encourage you to talk with them about their experiences. Um, can you please give us a story, Ms. Sherrod, about the uh, moment when you knew that civil rights and farming were intertwined? Well, I need to go back to the days that I worked on the, on the farm. I grew up on a farm. My, my father and many of the family members owned farm uh, that adjoined each other. And I also, it was located, it is located in Baker County, Georgia, where they practice segregation and discrimination probably more than many others. Uh, to this day, it's still known as the state of Baker. Uh, so growing up picking cotton and doing the other work on the farm, I vowed that I, once I finished high school, I didn't want to ever have anything to do with agriculture again in my life. And <laughs> my goal was to get out of Baker County. I intended to live my life in the North where I thought people were free. So, you know, my mind was focused on that at, during my senior year of high school. But uh, during March of my senior year, my father was murdered by a white farmer who was not prosecuted, even though there were witnesses. And that led me into the civil rights movement, uh, being able to fight the system uh, there, the sheriff there in Baker County. Um, I got really involved and, and made, I made a decision on the night of my father's death that I would not leave the South. I felt I had to do something. I'm the oldest of, at the time my mother was pregnant with um, the sixth child, I'm the oldest, and my father really wanted a son bad. Uh, so he had convinced my mother to try one more time for this boy. And the boy was born after he died. Um, but I made a commitment to stay in the South and devote my life to working for change. Um, if you're going to work in civil rights in the South, and if you're going to work in the rural area where I was living, you had to be involved with people, farmers, and others who were living on the land. And I ended up marrying the person who was one of the founding members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. So that work extended from Baker County into other areas in Southwest Georgia. Again. Farmers were the backbone of that movement because when you went to jail, many of them had to be bonded out by people uh, who owned land. Um, so one of the things that was happening is that people who lived on land, on plantation, and land, plantations and land owned by other white farmers would be kicked off the land 
if they participated in the civil rights movement. So we decided in 1968 to try to develop a system for dealing with that. We had seven people who went to Israel to study the kibbutz in anticipation of coming back to uh, create an organization so that we could buy land and have a place for people to settle. So they went to Israel to look at how Israel was resettling people and we were using that example to create our own organization. They came back and in 1969 we, we created New Communities Incorporated and we got our hands on 6,000 acres of land. We had been assured by OEO, the Office of Economic Opportunity, that there would be a major investment in helping to build this community from the government. They gave us a planning grant, and we were, you know, and I was really, really young at the time, and didn't anticipate the opposition from white people in the area. They fought us physically and, and politically. Uh, so that we couldn't, we could never get that money from the federal government, but we started farming to hold on to the land. Now, I went from not wanting to have anything to do with agriculture, and this was a major farming operation. Uh, really got involved in it, learning even more than I had learned growing up on the farm. But, and we were holding on to the land. We couldn't build the community, but we were holding on to that land, expand, expand, expanding the farming operation, and anticipating one day being able to build the community. But we ran into droughts. And um, after a second year of drought, we went to Farmers Home Administration to try to get an emergency loan. Um, we were involved in a three-year fight to try to get an emergency loan. And with three years, too many to try to continue to farm and hold on and so forth. To make a long story short, they, fork they, they, they engineered the foreclosure. We all know that when they get a lien, when you borrow, you have to give them a lien on all available assets. And even though we had assets worth over $4 million, they had to have a lien on everything, and that's when they could engineer the foreclosure. So in 1985, we lost everything. The new owner was a businessman from Atlanta who dug a hole and pushed all of our buildings over in them. So we were gone, and that, it was at that time I connected with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and had the opportunity to build a program to assist farmers, initially in the Southwest Georgia area, helping them to hold on to their farm. That's when I, you know, going from the civil rights movement where we were fighting for our rights into farming and economic development, that it just all came together. And I was so committed. Initially, my husband used to get on me because I'd be out in counties late at night, coming home by myself, you know, really working. Farmers, so many of them wouldn't even go into a local office unless either I was with them or others who had been trained to do the work would go in with them. And, you know, I can be soft, but I can be pretty, pretty bold at times. I can remember going into an office and I, I, I felt so bad because a woman, it was a white woman, but she was one of those who had been saying, she better not come over in this area with that stuff. We'll show her. Well, she did something wrong. I went with the farmer. I told him, I said, when you get your denial letter, go on and, and you know, the first part of the, part of the appeal process is to meet with the people who made the decision. So I said, go on and request a meeting, but don't tell her I'm coming with you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to drive about 150 miles to get to that office. So I was pretty mad when I got there. I wouldn't even sit down. She was trembling. I felt so bad for her. But he's <laughs> as I was driving back home. <laughs> but that farm is still in that family's hand today. <laughs> John Zippert, who worked 
who worked with and continues to work with Shirley Sherrod and with Ralph Page uh, over the years. I, I think I might be right in saying that you were the only one who didn't grow up on a farm on this panel, is that right? Yes. Uh, but has been working with farmers and landowners and trying to hold on to the land, particularly fighting black land laws, for 45 years. And I, this is a big job, but this, you're, you're, the, you're the cleanup hitter here and the, uh, the last one to speak. You probably had to deal with this all through school, having a name that starts with a Z, right? But the, uh, here, um, if you would talk about what keeps you going, and then on behalf of all of these folks whom I'm, I wish we could hear the answer from, but we're running out of time, what you would recommend for others, young people who want to get into this kind of work. Uh, thank you. I'm honored to be on this panel, and I'm honored to be here. And I was at the first Farmers and Ranchers Conference and been at a number of farm aid events th since then. It's very difficult for me to answer this question without telling a few stories. Is that, so, is that okay? <laughs> well, we have just a few minutes to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so I, I grew up in New York City, and I did spend some summers. My, my parents sent me to a chicken farm in New Jersey for many summers, so I developed a, an appreciation for and an interest in farming. In 1965, I decided to volunteer for the summer of 1965 with the Congress of Racial Equality, and they sent me to Louisiana. And when I got to Louisiana, I found out that most of the people that were there were afraid of the Civil Rights Movement. They were afraid to associate with civil rights workers because they were fearful of losing their job. And the people who were most interested in working with us were people who owned land, or people who were sharecropping on land owned by other black people. So that's really how I started my interest in farming and uh, rural concerns. And I helped to organize a sweet potato marketing co-op uh, there in Louisiana. And that co-op was one of the 22 cooperatives that formed the Federation of Southern Cooperatives in 1967. The, feder the Federation itself has acquired 1,300 acres of land in Sumter County, Alabama, where we have a train. And we got that land whole struggle with a local group of people who were evicted from plantations because they sued the plantation owner for a fair part of the government poor on cotton. It's a long story. But again, much of my work has been with farmers. I want to say for the last, since the mid-90s, and, and even before that, but since the mid-90s, I have been working on these discrimination cases. The Pickford case, Pickford 1, Pickford 2, to Keeps Eagle, and now we're dealing with the problems of the Hispanic and women settlement and that there are still problems out there. I got three phone calls on the, up here from people who were processed unfairly. So uh, the question of what keeps me going is that I'm a person who's concerned about justice and there's plenty of injustice out there to fight. I'm a person who is interested in hard work. Uh, I'm a workaholic, 
and please leave me alone <laughs> and let me do my thing. That, you know, you say, how do you, what keeps you going? The fight for just hard work, the love of people, which was discussed in depth by the first panel. To, when people come to me with a problem, I take the time to really understand what that problem is about and what the basis of it is. And then we start doing like Benny, looking in these books of regulations. And I have found that most of these agencies have six or seven books. And in the second book it says something, and in the sixth book it contradicts what it said in the second book. <laughs> so, you know, there's some of that. I guess the last thing is that I'm basically optimistic. And I, and I think we have changed some things. Not everything has been changed. And you have to be optimistic. You have to give people hope. You heard in the first panel that that's a lot of our interest in farm aid is based on the hope it's given us to keep going. So work for justice, work hard, love people, and be optimistic. And I would just say to young people, not only to people here, I say this to all young people. I started in this at 19, and I'm still going. And I, I frankly, <laughs> If, if the truth be told, my best work was done in my 20s. <laughs> so young people, go on out here and do what you feel needs to be done. That's my advice. And don't be afraid to volunteer sometime. I worked for two years for the Congress of Racial Equality, and after that first summer, they promised me $25 a week. They didn't always send it. In fact, it was rare. <laughs> so I had to raise money in the community. Uh, and people wanted my help and help to, to uh, have a place for me to stay. And, and ultimately, uh, you know, out of that organizing came the Federation and some of the resources that people have given to the Federation. So uh, I think young people need to get out here, stand up for what you believe in, love people and work with other people, and you can make some of the changes that need to be made. Great. We, could, we didn't get to everything that we want to ask you, but this just is a, is a, a reason for everyone in the, in the audience to come up to you and ask you questions. We hope, with the, as far as the film goes, that it will travel around. Uh, we're continuing to work on it. As you can see, we're continuing to make parts of the film. The, uh, the, all of them being together is such a wonderful experience for us. We've never seen them all in one room before, and it's a, it's a wonderful honor to have this happen here. This, I don't know how many years of work we have represented on this stage, how many different farms we have that have been saved, how many different people have been inspired by these, but this is not the end. As, as Willie Nelson says in the film, this is, the battle is not over. We know that they all, each one, in their own way, continues to do this kind of work. And I know all of you do too. Uh, they're the ones who got the love part right, coming back to that. And I also just got an uh, email with a quote from uh, the late Julian Bond, who was such a, a fighter. He said, good things don't come to those who wait. They come to those who agitate. Yeah. <laughs>